ask me what I get to do for a living, I have the pleasure of saying that I get to blow up stars for fun. By training, I'm a computational astrophysicist, which means, or just a fancy way of saying that I'm a little kid at heart. I always have my head in the clouds, I like to ponder big ideas, and I'm infatuated with pictures of space. But while the research that I do and the simulations that I conduct are timely and help out academia in general, what I really care about answering are the bigger questions. Like, so what? Who cares? Why does it affect you and me and our everyday lives? And so I want to begin a journey with all of you tonight around a very familiar picture of our home star, the sun. Responsible for giving us light and warmth and overall responsible for starting life here on Earth. Now, my area of expertise is looking at things kind of like the big brother of the sun, 20, 30, 50 times the mass. And while in certain space programs and certain media outlets, you might learn about what they look on the outside, sometimes they don't show what's going on under the hood. The more I look at massive stars, the more interesting they become because they resemble humans a lot. They have a lifeblood that's responsible for keeping them alive. That's that outer layer that you see behind me. At their central core, it's kind of their engine or their heart, like we have as humans. It's not a literal organ, but it is responsible for keeping the energy generating within it and keeping it alive. Now, the single thing that keeps all stars consistent, the reason we call stars stars, is that they're made of something called a plasma. It's the fourth state of matter. Here on Earth, we have solids that we interact with every day. We have liquids that we drink. We have gases that we breathe in and out. And plasmas are unique because they're very energetic. On a very small scale, these little particles are moving very quickly and bumping into each other, kind of like bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, if you will. Now, you might be wondering, Mike, what are these plasmas made out of? For the vast majority of the universe, it's mostly made up of hydrogen, the first element on the periodic table. And like I said, hydrogen in a plasma is moving very fast, and sometimes these things will stick together or fuse in a process we call nuclear fusion. A little bit of energy is released, and a new element is born, in this case, helium. Mike, what happens once all the hydrogen's used up? Well, the same game is played. The temperature goes up, the heliums move quicker, and those will fuse together as well in a new element we call carbon. By now, you're starting to see how the game is played. Hit carbon with another helium, you get something called oxygen. Hit it again, you get something called neon something we're very familiar with on the Las Vegas Strip in those bright neon signs. What we end up with is a picture a little bit different than what we started with. It still has a core made of heavy iron, but instead of one layer of hydrogen all the way around, it has concentric layers of different compositions, kind of like an onion structure, if you will, corresponding to different elements on each layer. Unfortunately, like all good things, they must eventually come to an end. And for the case of massive stars, an event goes on called a core collapse supernova. Behind me is a video or a simulation of the research that I predict and look at on how these explosive stars die. These supernovae are the catalyst for speeding up the chemical evolution of the universe. And as you can see, it's a pretty violent process. It completely destroys that cellular structure we were looking at before. And these things act as cosmic pinatas of sorts. Not with pieces of candy, but in this case, different elements. Flung to interstellar space, throughout the galaxy, planets like our own. Mike, you've been telling us a lot about the lifeblood and that plasma of the star. What kind of information can we get about the core? And for this, I like to use a, a fun analogy, so I'm going to need your help today. Uh, please raise your hand if you've been to a doctor's appointment before. Standard checkup, nothing special. Great. What's one of the first things they do when you go to the doctor? Check your pulse. Doctor pulls out their stethoscope, puts it on your heart, and feels for a signal. What they don't do, or what at least I hope they don't do, is lay you down on the table, cut open your chest, pull it open, and say, Mike, your heart looks great. I'll stitch you up and I'll see you in six more months. <laughs> I wouldn't go back there. For the past few thousand years, astronomy has been a science. We've been limited by our eyes. When we want to gain information about something, we have to look at it and receive light. In this case, if we're interested about the heart of a star, we can only get light from the outermost layer, because that's where it's being emitted from. 
Around 100 years ago, Einstein predicted something called gravitational waves, a new form of information that we can get from space. And a couple years ago, physicists won Nobel Prizes for it, for the first direct detection. Gravitational waves are very unique. They're a ripple through our space and time. And one of their very interesting properties is that they can uh, pass right through matter. In this case, that's advantageous. We get information directly from the, the core, and it's unobstructed as it goes outside of the star. Here at Michigan State, my research group provides direct support for those Nobel laureates. We give them signals that they should expect, and we can translate that signal into something we can use. Things like how it's rotating, as well as the nuclear reactions on the inside of that star. So what? Who cares? The astrophysics is interesting, the simulations are beautiful, the science is timely, but why does it affect you and me? If we do a little experiment, we take our high-powered telescopes, we look out into interstellar space, we can take a cosmic census. We can count each of those elements up by number, and we get a ranking from most to least common. Hydrogen, helium, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. For a moment, we're going to scratch helium off the list. That's something known as a noble gas. It means it kind of keeps to itself. It doesn't really like to react with many things. Now, what if we compared it to the human body? We're mostly made of water, which, if you remember from high school chemistry, is H2O. So hydrogen, by number, is vastly the most common element in the human body. Oxygen is next. We are carbon-based life forms. It fills our cells, pervades our bodies. It's what makes us up. Lastly, our DNA. It's what makes us human. Those are the same thing. And that's no coincidence. See, evolution took a page out of nature's book. With all the abundant elements in the universe, when it was creating planets, stars, galaxies, and human beings, it used the elements that were around. And like the saying goes, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. These are the lemons that we're made of. So I want to end our journey together where we started. Not around a picture of our home star, the sun, but around a simulation from a core collapse supernova, where our elements came from. And while these events seemingly happened very far away in interstellar space, they teach us a tremendous amount about the human condition and the value of keeping an open mind. Because whether it's a loved one in the audience, a friend you're watching with at home online, or just a stranger you're passing on the street. The single common thread that ties all of humanity together is that part of the elements in our body were forged in a brilliant stellar explosion billions of years ago and trillions of miles away. Thank you. <laughs>